Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. I'm honored to serve under our senior pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos, who've been doing this faithfully for many, many years. So yeah, applause for them. So, uh, exciting week. Last Tuesday, my new book came out, Connecting the Dots. Yeah. So, uh, it's, hmm. here's the challenge is uh, I'm already sick of talking about the book. <laughs> so, it's going to take some energy this morning. Uh, I've been talking all week, doing TV interviews. I did a TV interview with a um, it's Cornerstone TV Network or something like that. A bunch of TV interviews this week, a bunch of radio interviews, a bunch of podcasts, all weird hours. Uh, and so I've been talking about this book a whole lot, and I'm tired of hearing my voice. So um, yeah, so this may be a real short message today. No, I'm just kidding. It won't be. But uh, So we're going to continue talking today. This is a final installment in Connecting the Dots. Um, and the basic premise of the book is that God is always at work in your life, but most of the time you can't see it or understand it. The subtitle of the book is What God is Doing When Life Doesn't Make Sense. Um, and I think a lot of us, we've got seasons where we say, man, I'm just not sure what, what, God is, what God is up to. And maybe you're in a season right now where you're wondering that. And uh, somebody asked me on the interview, said, well, how do you know what God is doing? When li- how can you presume to know what God is doing? I'm like, well, he tells us what he's doing. He says, for we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, that's us, to those who are called according to his purpose. He's working things out for his purposes and your fulfillment right now in the middle of everything you're going through. And we're going to talk today about how, what God uses to transform us. And I, I honestly wish he used something else, <laughs> but uh, this is what he uses. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, Right after we moved to San Antonio, I discovered I have horrible allergies to cedar. Anybody relate? Cedar allergies, literally from November to January, it would wipe me out. I mean, just like, it would take me down, it would turn into sickness, and I'd be in bed for maybe two weeks sick with upper respiratory infections. And everybody's like, kind of like what Robin just said, welcome to Texas. I'm like, thanks. And there's like, there's nothing you can do about it. I was like, all right, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. So I just kind of learned to suck it up. I take a ton of Zyrtec. I literally would take Zyrtec every day. Um, then I'd switch over to Allegra because, you know, Zyrtec would lose its effect. And, uh, anyway, right in the middle of, I think it was about February, um, I felt like the Lord started telling me that I needed to up my game spiritually. And I thought, oh, man, what, is, what does that mean? And uh, it was actually right before I came to work here at Crossroads. Um, that's probably why I needed to up my game spiritually, right? And... Uh, and I, I felt like what he's told me to do is start fasting, not eat on Fridays. And I thought, man, I hate fasting. Fasting makes me less Jesus-like. <laughs> I get hangry. You know, like, if you want me to be Jesus-like, Lord, don't ask me to give up food, right? And I get angry and irritable. My head would start to hurt. I'm like, I don't. And, and I was already, the allergies were already taking me out. I'm like, I don't need this, you know. And I, felt, I just felt this real need to fast. So I, uh, I, I, you've heard my joke before that, you know, I used to set out to do a two-day fast and could only get through one day of it. And it made me wonder if I was a half-fast Christian, you know, <laughs> half-fast Christian, right? So I said that on a TV show the other day. It didn't go well. But anyway. <laughs> The guy's like, you're going to get the FCC on us. I'm like, what? Anyway. So I don't like fasting, but I started to do it on Fridays. And man, it was miserable. Uh, I didn't eat breakfast, and then I didn't eat lunch. And well, I, I, but basically, I started the night before. Like on, I, it's, I ate at like 6 o'clock as much as I could. I mean, I just loaded up on beef. And, and then I just sucked it up until 6 o'clock the next day, and then I ate. And so the first week was horrible. Got a headache, was grouchy, was miserable. The second week, just about the same. But the weird thing is about the third week of this, on Thursday night, I literally felt my body go, hey, we don't have to eat tomorrow. I was like, what? It's so weird. Like, who says that? Whose body says that, right? (laughs) 
And I, I started to kind of look forward to Fridays. And on Fridays, I was getting a lot accomplished. I had a lot of mental clarity. And yeah, I was still hungry. But it, 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 the effects of the fasting kind of diminished. I didn't get a headache anymore after a few weeks. It's like, man, I kind of like this. And then I read somewhere that early Christians started, that they would fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. So I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add Wednesday to my fasting regimen. So I wouldn't eat all Wednesday. Then I'd eat Thursday. And then I wouldn't eat Friday. And uh, I did this for about nine months. And I started noticing, you know, because I did it in about March. Come December, my allergies didn't take me out. And that, that, that month, uh, that, yeah, it was at the end of December. Marcus and I, we went and hiked in Israel. And there was a doctor on the hike. Um, and I was telling her about this. And she goes, well, that makes total sense. She said, when your body, it doesn't have to process food, it can go attack other stuff in your body. And I was like, oh, how interesting. She said, you'll get the same effects if you do intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting, what it means is like you just don't eat for about 16 hours and you just eat during one window in, every, in a day. So now, I start, so I started on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, only eating between noon and six. And uh, you, don't, you can't do any juice or anything in the morning because that sugar triggers your body. And this isn't a medical class or anything, but it, just, it triggers your body and fasting doesn't accomplish its full purposes at that point. So you can only drink coffee with no sugar in the morning, which that was a new thing for me. Because I used to like, uh, I like, used to like a little coffee with my sugar, but uh, <laughs> no milk either, right? So I started doing this, and like everything started changing. My my mental clarity started like really getting better. I I started getting sick a lot less, and it. The other thing that happened is, um, I I used to have like probably about forty pounds worth of muscle right here, that <laughs> it actually went away, and uh, I always called it muscle, but you know it wasn't muscle, but. Um, if y'all see pictures of me when I first got here at Crossroads, I had a bit of a, a thing going right here, and it went away. And I didn't have to change anything I did. Well, I changed a lot I did, but I didn't have to change what I eat. I still drink Dr. Peppers and stuff, but I only eat during that noon and six. And so I started doing a little research on it, and I found that, that fasting is, is really quite amazing. Um, one of the things I talk about is that there's certain, um, this Mediterranean diet that they say is really good for you. And they say the Mediterranean diet is super good for you because of the things in the, in the, in the diet. But there's this, there's this guy named Nassim Taleb. We're going to talk about him in a minute. And he said, the thing that people don't point out about the Mediterranean diet is people that live around the Mediterranean are either Orthodox Christians or they're Muslims. And the Orthodox and the Muslim have about 100 fasting days a year in their calendar. So they eat a third less food than us. And if you look at longitudinal studies of health, the number one predictor of longevity in life is minimized caloric intake. Basically, you eat too much, it kills you. We're made to have a little deprivation. And the crazy thing is, I knew deprivation was not, I mean, like that, that's, that's why I didn't want to fast. Who likes being deprived of something they like? But when I got into it, I didn't realize all of the benefits I would get from obeying God in that one area of fasting on Friday. And here's what I've, I've discovered about everybody, right? All of us in this room, there's something in our lives that we're looking at it and we're going, I really should do that. Maybe the Lord's been telling you, you've got to get things under control in your finance, and you're like, I know, I really should do the Dave Ramsey course. I really should get a budget. You know, some of you, he's been talking about that with your health. You're realizing, I got to get this health situation under control. Um, some of you, God's been asking you to up your spiritual game with some things. He's been asking you to commit to serving at the church and some things. And um, We've all got something in our life that when we look at it, we go, ugh. I, I really know I should do that, but if I do that, that means I'm going to have to do this, and I don't like that. If I fully commit, that means I'm going to have to go over here. I was talking to somebody the other day. He said, man, if I fully commit to this marriage, I might get burned again. I'm like, yeah, there's a good chance you will. I think we can all relate to the words of C.S. Lewis. I love this quote. He says, we aren't necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. We know, like, God, I really believe your plans are good for me. Ugh, but man, how much is it going to hurt how much I got to give up? And at some point, we, we all come to a point in our life where we've got to make a decision to go all in on what he's asking us to do. Otherwise, we wind up like Tarzan swinging through the jungle, who to keep his forward momentum, he's got to let go of the vine he's holding on to and grab a vine that hasn't been tested and tried to keep the motion going. If he hangs onto this vine test to test this one over here, he's going to end up dangling like a fool in the jungle. Forward movement requires letting go and going all in on what's ahead, even if you're not sure what the outcome's going to be. 
So this book, Connecting the Dots, we've been talking about is that God is always at work in your life. We've been looking at this sequence, uh, this pattern here. The Lord, the, he, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. He guides me in paths of righteousness. And that Hebrew word path it means paths, essentially made paths made of circles. And what I believe this means and, is that God leads us forever. He's forever growing us into who he wants us to be. But he leads us not in a straight line, but in a circular path where you find yourself coming back to certain themes in your life certain places, maybe certain concepts, maybe certain time frames. You're like, man, every three years, every seven years, something changes. And you find yourself doing it over and over again. You're like, this again? But every time you do it, God looks a little different. You look a little different. And hopefully, you're a little bit more mature. And he's growing you, right? He's growing you. And we talked, we've been talking about all these stages. We talked about the turning point that's required, the courage that's required, the guide. Today, I want to talk about the fact that after this first stage where you, this life changes, you kind of have, are forced to dive in on the season. And courage is, you, you step in with courage, the guide appears, the Holy Spirit is our guide to show us. There some comes, comes a point where you just got to kind of stop Googling stuff and researching and commit. You got to make the decision to commit to the path. This word, suneko, uh, the Apostle Paul says, if we're out of our mind, as some say, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us. This word compels, uh, it, it's a weird word. Some translations of your Bible, it'll say constrains. And compels is push forward. Constrains means hold back. You're like, well, which one is it? And the, the verb means to be held, to urge, to impel, or to press together with a hand. So it's this sense that God's love comes around you, and he says, I love you so much. Now I'm going to squeeze you like a tube of toothpaste to become all you can. And he pushes us out to become all he intends us to be. But a lot of times, let's be honest, we resist his prodding to become all he wants us to be because it usually shows up as something that's very uncomfortable. When he asks us to do something, there's a very good chance it's going to be something out of your comfort zone. It's going to be something you go, isn't there another way to do this, Lord? Do we have to do this this way? Think about even Jesus. He said to the Lord right before he was going to the cross, he said, Lord, if there's any other way to do this, I'll take it. <laughs> but not my will, but your will be done. Even Jesus was like, man, I wish there was another way to do this. But this is the way. And he committed to the path, and thank goodness he did. So there comes this point in all of our lives where we, where we know, like, man, I know what's ahead here. We know the, the adventure, and the challenges are ahead, the dark caves ahead, the resolution. But we go, man, I just don't know if I'm ready to fully commit. And so there's this passage that I love. I love it because I've talked to you guys before about, you know, we all love sweet, compassionate Jesus. But there's savage Jesus, too. There's the Jesus that said all sorts of stuff. You're like, Jesus, that is not very Jesus-like of you. He said some crazy things. You're like, whoa, that's hardcore, man. There's this one point where Jesus was, was walking along, you know, bring his disciples along. And a couple people said they wanted to start to follow him. So as they're going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. Man, I'm all in. I'm committed to you, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, okay, that's cool, but just make sure you know this. Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's like, FYI, this is going to take some serious commitment, because it's going to get hard. And then he says to another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Seems like a reasonable request. Go bury your father. And then savage Jesus comes out. Jesus said to him, hey, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. And this is what Jesus said to him. This is where Jesus is like super hardcore. I'm like, man, Jesus, you could have been a little nicer. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't seem to have a lot of tolerance for half-fast Christianity. And here, here's why I think that is. I think he knew that if you commit to the path, the way will open to you. That sounds so zen. But, you know, he asked us to do things in faith. And if you saw the whole path ahead, that wouldn't require faith. And the real challenging thing is there's going to be some hardships ahead. And I think he knows this is going to break, require a level of commitment that's beyond what most people realize. When I take teams to Israel... One of the first questions that people always, I, I just drove me crazy. I would always get this question. They would say, is, is, is Israel safe? That was the first question they'd always ask before they wanted to sign up. They're like, hey, I'm about to sign up for the trip, but is Israel safe? 
And I got so tired of the question, I created this application packet, and then at the front I said, don't fill out this application packet until you've read these frequently asked questions. And the first one says, is Israel safe? And I wrote, life is inherently dangerous. Because you will be alive on this trip, there is an element of danger involved. And then I go into all the dangers. Now, I know I've scared away some probably wonderful, loving people. But the fact is, this trip requires a little bit more than just a walk through Disneyland. It requires a commitment because the time Marcus and I did it, it was raining like cats and dogs the whole time on us. We're hiking through and we've got a foot of mud literally on our feet just stuck and we're like walking like this. It was really miserable for about three days of it. And then we got to Jerusalem. At, well, actually, the next trip, we got to Jerusalem, and, and uh, it, that was when Donald Trump took out that um, Iranian guy. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, World War III is about to start right where you're at. And everybody's freaking out. All of our friends are texting us from home, like, get out of there, get out of there. Iran's going to nuke you. And we're like, what is, not, is it safe? I don't know. But here's, is life ever safe? You've got to decide I'm going to go all in. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, there's going to be some challenges ahead and I need to know that you're all in and committed to this because if you're not all in committed, if you keep one foot over here and one foot over here, there's a good chance you're just going to be miserable or you're going to back out. I had a guy tell me this one time. He's like, man, life was a lot easier before I was a Christian. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I used to take advantage of people all the time and didn't feel bad about it. He's like, now I got to get this conviction. I feel bad about it. I got to go make things right. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Look, a lot of people have just enough Jesus in them to be miserable. But they don't go fully commit to obeying whatever he says. So they've got the rules and stuff. But they don't realize that when you walk in commitment to him, full commitment to him and obey whatever he says, even if it doesn't make sense what he's asking you to do, there's this benefit that comes. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Know this, there's some hard stuff that comes with following Jesus, but there are some benefits that you will never see until you fully commit. And so many people, man, they just, they, 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 they start following Jesus when life maybe hits the fan and they come here and then when life gets under control again, they start leaving and they just kind of in and out of the church. They're not committed. And I'm again, making, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than parking a garage makes you a car. But there's an element of, like, your commitment to church shows your commitment to the body of Christ. And a lot of people, oh, I just love Jesus. I don't know what's wrong with my family. Well, when soccer season hits, we don't see you. Because you're more committed to soccer than you are to the church. Or whatever it is. And again, I'm just telling the truth here because I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years and I've seen this over and over again. And people go... Man, how come I just, this Christian faith thing, I just, I'm doing my best to raise my kids. I'm like, you aren't showing you're fully committed to this thing here. You're showing you'll dip your toe in as much as you can without having to fully commit. But when something better comes up, like you want your kid to get a soccer scholarship and soccer happens to be on Sundays, you decide, well, soccer is more important because Jesus wants my kid to have a scholarship. Like the reason your kids don't listen to you is because they're too busy watching you. That's just the bottom line. I'm not trying to slap you all around, but I'm telling you, like, <laughs> savage Jesus says this. <laughs> like, he's like, you got to go all in, man, because here's the thing. It's going to get hard. The next stage in the journey is this state, is this, uh, it's, is the adventure, right? G.K. Chesterton says an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. Oh, come on. It's not an adventure until something goes wrong. And most of us say we want adventure, but we want it on our terms. We want a Disney adventure where everything is perfectly curated. What an adventure we had. Yeah, yes, that wasn't an adventure. An adventure is when everything goes south. And that's what makes for the great stories. In the middle of it, it's horrible. Hiking in the rain in Israel comes to mind. That was like the worst hike ever. But I remember every minute of it. And it built character, right? Pastor Marcus, man, I'll never forget coming down on that hill. We basically were sliding down that hill when we got to the bottom. I think we did slide at some point. Yeah, yeah, it's too crazy. So you come to this place where there's this adventure, and, and, and the, the thing with the adventure is it, it creates these struggles and challenges that we have to face. And I think it's, it's normal to want to avoid struggles. 
I mean, I don't know any normal person that likes pain. If you like pain normally, there's probably something off in your brain. There is something off in your brain. Go see a counselor. <laughs> there's a guy named Nassim Taleb. He talks about this idea that there are three kinds of systems in the world. Y'all have heard me talk about this before, but he says there's fragile systems that break when they're exposed to stress. There are robust systems that, that they're unaffected, like this amazing, beautiful stage that somebody donated to the church here. Thank you. They will remain anonymous. They don't want to be made known. But this stage is pretty robust. I can kick it. I can be like, hey, stupid. And it doesn't cry doesn't look, ask for a safe space or anything. It's just, it's robust. It's unmoved, right? But he says, fragile and robust are in opposites because fragile stuff breaks, robust stuff is unchanged. He says, there's a third kind of organism in the world. He says, what I, he calls them anti-fragile organisms. And an anti-fragile organism is a system which becomes stronger and more powerful as a result of stress, shocks, volatility, that means uncertainty, noise, mistakes, faults, attacks, or failures. He says the opposite of a fragile system is an anti-fragile system. And there are certain fragile, anti-fragile systems in the world that as they're exposed to stress, they get stronger. And you are anti-fragile. God made you that way. You are made to handle a little bit of stress, a little deprivation like with fasting. And through that, it makes you stronger in a very real way, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Nietzsche said that, and then Kelly Clarkson made it into a song. <laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you strong. Now, here's the important thing about this. If you treat an anti-fragile system like it's fragile, it will actually become fragile. So if you treat a human being like they're fragile, they will become fragile. Now, obviously, this is within reason, right? We don't want to be abusive. But a lot of times we try and protect people from the very thing that God wants to use to strengthen and build them. And this is a challenge we face in our country right now. People say, well, I don't want to hear uncomfortable things. Well, the truth is very uncomfortable, always. And if you shelter yourself from any truth because it might make you feel uncomfortable, you're going to become a weak little snowflake. You need these stressors in your life. Again, it's within reason, but he also says this. He says anti-fragile systems can't go forever. He says they have to take a break. And you know this because when you work out, they say when you're building muscle, you've got to give yourself a rest day. So you work out. If you're always working out, it's actually going to become counterproductive. You've got to give yourself time to rest because what's happening when you're building muscle is you're actually tearing the muscle. And then when it heals back, it heals back stronger. Some of y'all know this because you had a leg broken or an arm broken. And they say when it heals back, if it heals back correctly, it actually heals back stronger than before. So in, in many ways, it becomes a blessing because you get stronger through it if there's time to rest. And in our life, in every season of life, there are going to be a series of challenges you face that God is going to use to accomplish his purposes within you. And unfortunately, I, I wish this wasn't the case, but there's a verse in Acts and it says, and Paul went around encouraging the believers, telling them through much suffering you enter the kingdom of God. I'm like, encouraging the believers? That's not very encouraging. And, th and, and that's where you recognize that, that Paul, like one of the weird things he said is this. He said, we rejoice in our suffering. Now, normally you would think that guy's got some issues. Who rejoices in their suffering? But you can only rejoice in your suffering when you know that suffering is accomplishing something in your life. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Remember grandma used to say that all the time? It builds character, son. And character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul knew the power of the suffering that God allows into our life. He says, look, we, we can rejoice in this. That's the only reason we can rejoice in it, because we know that suffering produces something. And you know, when you go to the gym and start working out, and the next day you're sore and your muscles are burning, you don't go, oh, what's wrong with me? You go, oh, it's working. It's working. I'm getting stronger. Like you inherently, instinctively know that when the muscles are sore, something good is happening. You're getting stronger. But it takes that pain to get through it. And I wish Paul had gone around saying, through much Krispy Kreme, we enter the kingdom of God. But he didn't. 
He said, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. And I don't like that. But it's the reality we face. So if, here, here's the message for you this morning. If you're going through suffering this morning, it's one of two things. This is kind of my life message right here. There's unnecessary suffering that we can avoid by using God's principles and the order he put into place. There's stuff that we just create. There's unnecessary stuff when we create just because we don't have wisdom to know what God asks of us. But there's also necessary suffering. And when you're facing necessary suffering, things you just can't get around where things are kind of out of your control, you've got to decide, I'm going to rejoice in that and keep perspective on it. That's my goal with this whole book is I want you to see that some of the, the necessary suffering we're going through, if you can have perspective in the middle of it, it can actually accomplish something. And this is another thing Paul says that I love. He says, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction, you could say suffering, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we look not to what are things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. You've heard me quote this verse a ton. It's one of my favorites. For the things that are seen, they're passing, they're transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. God has a way bigger perspective in mind than just right now. He's looking way down the road to your future. And I'm not just talking future on earth. I'm talking about your future in eternity. You know, in eternity, you're not going to be sitting on a cloud plucking a harp. It says you're going to be ruling and reigning the universe with him. Like, you're going to be in charge, y'all. All of us. That's a scary proposition. Some of us really, really need to get our act together. <laughs> but think about this. What he's preparing you for right now is ruling and reigning with him in eternity. That's how we can have an eternal perspective. And I don't know how it all adds up. I don't know how the struggles you face here are going to play out in the future when you're like, well, is it, if there's no sin, how does that play out? I don't know. But there's character that's being developed within you that you're going to need for your future. And I don't believe it's just in eternity. I believe it's your future right here, right now. I believe that God is preparing you with a very unique message to share and a unique problem to solve. And everything that you've gone through in your life all the struggles in every circle you've gone through, all the adventure has prepared for you this message that you're called to share. My message that I've landed on is stop unnecessary suffering through wisdom, find meaning in necessary suffering through perspective. If you read my books, that's what I talk about all the time, ad nauseum, forever and forever. I feel like that's the message he's put within me, wisdom and perspective, wisdom and perspective. It's so funny hearing people's kind of takes on this. And in fact, somebody wrote the other day, they're like, wow, there's so much wisdom and perspective in this book. I'm like, nailed it. <laughs> like, and that's something God did in me. I didn't figure that out on my own. He worked that in me. And there's a thread, a consistent thread of meaning in everything he's been building into you, right? Life doesn't get easier. We get stronger. And as we get stronger, we get a message of God's work in our lives. And that message, your survival story will oftentimes become someone else's survival manual as God puts you right in the place to minister to somebody who needs exactly to hear what you've been through. And you say, look, our situation's a little bit different, but I've been through something hard like that, and I know God's going to carry you through this. And you've got a message to share of his grace in your life. There's a verse in Revelation that says, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb is the power that's the Jesus coming and his redemption, his forgiveness of your sins, wiping away everything you've ever done. But it's not just that. He's also turning all things together for your good through his blood. And the power gets unleashed when you're willing to tell people the story of what he's done in your life, even if some of it maybe felt a little shameful. Some of the stuff you're man, I, just, I don't know if I want to share that with people. Listen to me. There's somebody out there who feels like they're all alone and nobody understands their pain. And he's put in you, because of your life message, your life story, the exact thing they need to hear if you'll be willing to share that story. And that's the power of connecting the dots. So a couple weeks ago, right before the book came out, I went to see my cousin. He's a, he's a teacher. And he said, um, should have put a blank slide in there, sorry. Um, he said, I wish you would have talked to me before you wrote that book. I'm like, why? He goes, I know, I know, that I know how to do the connecting the dots. And I'm like... What do you mean you know how to do the connecting the dots? And he started telling me. 
He's a teacher that teaches teachers how to teach. He started telling me about a guy named Reuven Feuerstein, who, Feuerstein, he was uh, a, a Jew during the Holocaust. And after the Holocaust and World War II was over, they started taking Jews from Europe and sending them to Israel. But he found there was an entire generation of these kids that could not learn because of their experience growing up in the trauma of growing up in the, the uh, extermination camps, the Nazi um, camps. So he started researching, how do you teach people to learn if they like, missed that window of learning? If all they had around them was just chaos and destruction? He, he came up with this instrument that he calls connecting the dots, believe it or not. And he puts a bunch of random dots on this picture, and then a couple of them are a little bit darker than others, and they form shapes. And he, he teaches kids to look for the subtle little differences and identify the shapes in the middle of the chaos. And when they begin to see the shape, the patterns in the middle of the chaos, something triggers in their brain, and for the first time, they can actually begin to learn. And Feuerstein's work has been used to help people with autism learn. They use it all over the world now. And it all comes with the first instrument. The first instrument is literally called Connecting the Dots. Did not know this when I wrote the book. Where you find meaning in the chaos, and you find shapes of I think God's work in the middle of what seems like total randomness. You know what's really crazy? The second instrument is they give these kids these shapes and they have to feel them with their hands and then they blindfold them and they have to identify them by faith, what they're holding on to. Anyways, that's my next book, I think. But isn't that amazing? Like God knows that like there's a pattern to what's going on and, and I think that the, the, the first step to really beginning to see what he's been doing in your life is to begin to look backwards. That's my goal with this book, is to look backwards and say, oh my gosh, this is the thing I've heard a dozen times this week on all the interviews. They're like, I started reading your book. It's like you wrote the story of my life. I'm like, that's because it's the story of everybody's life. It follows this pattern. It follows this pattern. And, and I believe as you begin to look back and see, man, in what looked like chaos, there's some points of meaning in there. And you start to pull those out, you're going to start to go, oh my goodness, God knew what he was up to. There have been several times in my life where I'm like, man, when I stand before God, I'm going to ask him what he's been doing. Like, what was that all about? But the funny thing is, anytime you see in the Bible somebody comes face to face with God, they don't ask a, lot, a whole lot of questions. They tend to drop to their knees and go, true and just were your judgments. <laughs> true and just were your judgments. And I believe that's what you're going to find in your life. The longer you live, the more you stay in faith, trusting that he's working all things together for good in your life, even in the middle of what's going on right now. What's going on right now could actually turn out to be the best thing ever for you. You go, well, I screwed this up myself. Look, God's already accounted for our stupidity in his plan. He's going to work all things together for good. Even the stuff you screwed up, just surrender to him. Surrender it to him. And then live in faith, knowing that at some point you're going to look back and go, wow, true and just were your judgments. I don't know why. I didn't know at the time why you were letting that happen. But now I see true and just are your judgments. Man, what you did, you do. Man, all your ways are perfect. All your ways are just. And I'm going to trust you right now. And as you look back and see his faithfulness, it's going to give you courage to face the things that are ahead. Because here's what happens. As the circle comes to a wrapping point, we won't go through these because we're out of time. But you can get them in the book. If it comes to a wrapping point, a new turning point begins. And you face a whole new series of adventures <laughs> as he expands out who you are in ever-increasing glory, accomplishing his work in you, making you more like Jesus. That's the message. I hope this has been an encouraging series for you guys. Man, I just pray that, um, you know, if you don't want to buy the book, there's a version devotional about it. You can get that version Bible app. It's on there. Just put my name in. Um, we've got this one called Connecting the Dots. It's actually doing quite well. It's only been out for a couple, like two weeks, and it's kind of doing really well, the, the number of people that are downloading it. And then um, we're going to have another one called The Dark Cave that's going to come out in a few weeks. So man, my prayer for you guys is you just begin to see God really is working behind the scenes in your life, whether you can see it or understand it, and trust that right now, even in the middle of everything you're going through, even all the things that you went through, he was preparing you for your greatest days. Amen. You're not done. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Y'all receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you are working all things for your purpose, your plan, and for we get to take part in the glory in that. So I thank you, Lord. I pray for those this, this morning that, man, they've been, 
They've had some painful seasons in their life. They've gone through more pain than anyone should have to endure, Lord, but we know that you are working even in that pain. So I pray this morning, Lord, those that are looking at their life and going, what is happening? I pray, Lord, this would just be, just breathe your breath of inspiration to them saying that they would know that, man, you're right there right now. And they're just in the middle of a circle, right in the season of you preparing them for what's ahead. We thank you, Lord, that you accomplish all things for your glory. If you're here this morning and you have not got your relationship right with Jesus, you know who you are as I've been talking. You've already been feeling it in your heart. I'm going to say a prayer, and if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness. He's going to give you an eternal address in eternity with him. He's going to set you up to rule and reign with him in the future, and I believe he's going to begin to show you his purposes in your life. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's just say this. And, uh, let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you in the back to help you. Uh, the book's available in the back, or you can check out the version. You guys be blessed. Have a great week. Let your light shine for men. They may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.